Well, this is the title of my talk, and after all the great presentations we made, you guys can consider this fact or fiction. <laughs> but I'm going to try to read some of it. And I had, by the way, I will I'll make an excuse right now for myself. I tried to steal a couple pictures off the internet because I couldn't find or didn't have pictures that I wanted. And so uh, and I, I'm not a photographer, so if, you'll just have to imagine that it's crystal clear and pretty because it is. <laughs> All right, the route Antonio Armillo followed in 1829 between the San Juan River and near present day Four Corners to the Spanish Trail on Utah Hill, west of St. George, Utah is still a subject of considerable interest. In particular, the path, the, the question of the path his caravan took on reaching the Coxcomb, just beyond the Korea River, that of the Hurricane Fall, further west, and the direction they took at the junction of the Virgin River and Santa Clara River are still being debated. And, uh, People have still have strong views on those questions. Well, in 2004, that was the last stage conference, I believe, too, was it not? Okay, so uh, I examined the water supply papers of geologist geographer Herbert E. Gregory in the region of northeast Arizona. And I concluded that Armijo's party followed the path that provided ample water in some cases, the only path with water for a crew of 60 men and possibly 100 horses and mules. You've got to remember, this is not a small party. 60 men, it's a big group. Uh, and uh, carried all the dry goods that they took to California. And I really appreciate the understanding of you know, why there wasn't wool rugs and serapes and everything else in California. But I got many of the answers today, and I appreciate that. Now, given the rugged terrain between the San Juan River and the Colorado River, I have not changed my mind. There is no viable route other than to follow the Navajo pathway to the Ute crossing our present day crossing of the fathers. Now, despite Armijo's frustratingly short and cryptic journal <laughs> entries, there's no doubt that he crossed the, the Colorado River at the crossing of the fathers and even upgraded the path used 53 years before by Dominguez and Mason. Well, he devoted nine lines of his short printed journal for the crossing. Now you look at, look, the first is the introduction. Now look down and see where the nine lines are. They're in the second column. And you can figure out, even if you don't read any uh, Spanish, that's where he crossed the, father, the crossing of the fathers. It's, it's described in detail, enough detail to go, there should be no one in their right mind uh, who doesn't believe that Armillo crossed the Colorado at New Cross. Be, now, because of my follow the water reason, and that, I was big on that because I was doing a lot of stuff on urban lately, I assumed that Armillo's group traveled up the Korea River to the site of the future tiny village of Perea, then journeyed southwest uh, to Canaptric near present-day Fredonia, Arizona. After re-examining the Mormon militia expeditions during the Black Hawk War from 1866 and 70, uh, discussed briefly by Jim Page, who's going to, you know, and I hope I don't ruin any of your talks. I apologize. Anyway, Jim, Jim Page's 2013 article uh, 
it, you know, he discussed the fact that the military <coughs> said they couldn't cross the uh, Costco. Uh, anyway, yeah. And I also found information from the 1901 Howard Carpenter Arizona Utah Boundary Survey in 1901. Now you might think, eh, that's pretty soon. Right? Uh, let's, let's see, I better see where I'm at. Okay, here's the cost going. And that's the one I, well, that's one I stole, so it's not too bad. And the personal uh, travel uh, along the Peria River, I, I've since changed my mind. Right. I also might admit that I changed my mind on a couple of things there. I, I used to say, well, you follow the water, you follow the water, and then you know where they went. But I finally decided in recent years, you follow the water where you have lots of water from Santa Fe to the Colorado River, basically, or just before the Colorado River. Then after that, you follow the philosophy. My philosophy is, you go west or southwest as fast as you can, okay? And you don't worry about water. Because if you keep worrying about water, you, I mean, you can do a leisurely trip to the, basically to the Colorado River. Then after that, it's not leisure anymore, as we found out. Well, uh, and also personal travel. Uh, the three things have happened. Military documents, or, uh, Howard Carpenter's uh, survey, and my personal travel on the on the uh, Korea. I feel strongly now that Armijo crossed what we now call the Coxstone and camped in the Pinion Juniper Trace on the north end of the Kaibab Mountain. In his summary, uh, now in his summary of the Arizona Territory Utah boundary. Carpenter wrote, let me quote what he wrote. We used for, this is 1901, there is absolutely no road between Page, Arizona, which doesn't exist, and Connect. All right, there's absolutely no road. Everyone understand that. There's a few uh, farmer roads, they had route, routes that went to the uh, uh, south. Uh, to the uh, Lee Fair, but there are no roads across the Coxcomb. And anyway, quote, we used the transportation of supplies and camp equipage along the line, a pack train composed of horses and burros used wagons for hauling freight and water. So this is the things they had to have to do the boundary survey from the initial corner, right, Nevada, Arizona, Utah corner, as far east as the Colorado River. Bam! I couldn't believe what I was reading. They used wagons all the way to the Colorado River. It changed my mind. From the river eastward, and I'm still quoting, from the river eastward, wagons could not be used and we had to rely on pack train except that we managed to get a wagon and a load of supplies from Bluff City on the San Juan River to come out and meet us at Monument Pass, unquote. 1901, Carpenter took a wagon across the uh, Costco. Now you say, well, that's easy to do, just go on up to uh, the box and go down the river. But now, let me read from the actual journal. On May the 2nd, 1901, Carpenter reached the House Rock Road, just uh, past milepost 112. Now they started at zero at the three-corner point, and they didn't put two, they had 277, or, and then they, it was quite, not quite 278 at the four corner point. So at mile post 112, so you know where you're at, with, with considerable difficulty, his crew 
was able to continue marking the boundary for another eight miles. So now we're on the house, the uh, house rock road. Uh, they had another, uh, earlier people had other names for it. But the house rock road, and he still surveys eight miles east. Now, I don't know if any of you have been in there, but well, it's all of the famous stuff that we see now. You people usually go one or two miles in to see the way and those things, or two, two or three miles. They don't go in eight miles. Because what happens in eight miles? There, they reach the junction. Well, it's not quite, but it's very, very close. The junction of Buckskin Gulch and the Korea River at the 37th mile. He wrote, quote, foot of wall course north and south. They went to it, saw it, went perpendicular about 1,000 feet. <coughs> so he makes the this, the river, the Korea River, and he goes over and looks 1,000 feet north and south. He says, how am I going to keep doing the survey? Here's how he thinks. He wrote uh, and continued. The survey could not continue east. It just was impossible. The next day, Carpenter wrote, the next day, May the 2nd, I have to make a detour around the head of Buckskin Gulch and five or six miles north to cross the canyon of the Perea. And oh, let's see, you go even if you go to the head of Buckskin Gulch, and I think some of you have been down the road know where that is, five or six miles north is where? Not Perea Township. Not even close. It's at least 20 miles, or there about 15, 20 miles south. Carpenter and his crew found a wagon crossing of the Coxcomb that was at least 15 to 20 miles south of the Perea Township. Despite the continued difficulties, the survey was able to mark the line, and with some offsets, until they reached the Colorado River cliffs on the 8th of May. So I'll give you some idea. The only, and again, the only place to cross the river and continue their survey east was at crossing of the Fathers, at least at the 37th parallel. Carpenter's crew hired boats from Leesbury. Oh, Leesbury is there. Oh, I guess you can still get across the river there to get his crew and supplies across the river. His horses and mules were forced to swim behind. We've already learned about how good horses are in swimming, and that's what they did in 1902. Because of the establishment of the ferry, few people, primarily prospectors and maybe a few others, would attempt uh, a crossing of the Colorado River at the historic place until work began on the Glen Canyon Dam in the 1950s, late 1950s. And then, of course, they bury it, so unless you have, uh, you know, your underwater gear, you probably can't cross today. Carpenter's survey continued to follow the 37th parallel to Fort Warner. I feel confident that Armillo's party followed the water from the San Juan River to New Crossing. Then from that time forward, they went westward, west or southwest, whenever possible to save time. There's just no question after that. I think he knew what he was getting into. Anyway, the Mormon militia confirms the crossing of the Coxcomb was possible. And in fact, let me see if I've got it up today. Oh, here we go. And I want to get to here. The Mormon militia confirms the crossing of Coxcomb was possible. And in fact, they crossed the rugged terrain at least once in 1869. Even though Armijo would have plenty of water by traveling north up the Korea River, then when they reached the Coxcomb region, traveling north was the wrong direction for him, and his party may have found other difficulties at a place on the Perea River called the Box, 
It looks pretty good from here. Uh, it probably looks blurry or something. I don't know. <laughs> the Mormon militia noted as they traveled down the Carib in March 1869. So there are several expeditions. They're fighting a war with the Navajo. Because the Navajo keeps coming to Utah, stealing stuff, horses, whatever, taking them back across the river at U Cross. This is the lowest. Now, this is what they wrote in March 1869. This is the lowest point we can take a wagon with safety, as the bottom is considerably washed out and quicksand back. That's 1869. Uh, now, the description reminded me of an experience I had with a group of geologists on a conference field trip into the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in 1997. The plan was to drive down the river, which we started, from Korea Township, through the box, and come out off the Cottonwood Road in, in Highway 89. Some of you may have even done it. The second of about 24 wheel drive vehicles got stuck in the quicksand. Personal experience. Things haven't changed much since 1869. 1997. It took a party of nearly, our party nearly, of course I didn't help much because I'd be just in the way, but it took the party nearly two hours to get the vehicle out with modern equipment and other vehicles to pull and strain and needless to say we had to reverse our passage path to get out before the daylight would be gone. This was in November by the way. Journal entry from November 3rd. We had to get out, even feel sort of safe after dark in that area. It, it's not the way to go. Okay? The Mormon militia, militia told you that. And I know Paul had some great pictures of a horse with some people caught in a little quicksand pond in one of the uh, places. It's, it's, it's tough going through that. Another group of Mormon militia in November 1869, this is several months later, were chasing Navajo Indians who had stolen horses from Mormon settlements north of St. George. And the group went to Ute Crossing to possibly intercept the thief. So they headed out from Kadab, went over and down through the box and over because they, you know, they had figured out ways to get around the sands, the quicksand. And they were on their way, they didn't find anything. They were on their way back to Kanab, and they noticed a trail of fresh tracks that went south across the north end of the Buckskin Mountain. The report reads, and I quote, there were about 12 horses, and we thought two Indians, by the way, Indians is not 12 of the capital I, in five minutes, in five minutes, we set our pack mule on to Kanab with our blankets and provisions by an Indian, a friendly Paiute, by the way. And we took the trail straight across the Buckskin Mountains into the Great Gulch, i.e. Upper House Rock Wash, on the east side of the Buckskin Mountains, over a steep backbone of rocks, down a wash into the Korea. They, they did it. They were already riding horses across it. Now, uh, let's see. The, I should read the rest. The posse of five men caught up with the thieves, but they were too late to safely get the horses back without loss of life, since the Indians had the advantage in the protected canyons of the really north now, towards the uh, crossing of the fathers. Uh, they went on home, but may have injured one Indian with some gunshots. Armillo's journal seems to indicate that their group crossed the coxcomb. If, if you read it, it's, I think it's, we talk about nine lines for, for the uh, Colorado River. It's about 20 letters crossing the coxcomb. Okay. I mean, that's, they don't talk very much about what they did. And they, and they 
on an old Indian trail and did not travel up the Korea River. I actually think they just run on, happened to run on to a good Indian trail that went across the Costco and they just followed. Our English translation, in fact, reads, at the top of the tree covered ridge, no water. Maybe they're talking about after they went through the coxcomb or the box, but I don't think so. Anyway, the evidence for Armigo's caravan crossing the coxcomb is very strong. The information about Armigo's journey from the coxcomb to the hurricane fall in the journal entries is only four lines long. Now we gotta go all the way from the coxcomb to the hurricane fall. Four lines. We went back to it, you could probably find it. Oh, uh, by the way, I I explored the Korea. I, I'm just adding that this is not in the paper. I wanted to go see this, the Gregory Pedestal, which is right along the, the uh, Korea River. A wonderful, I mean, it's about I don't know, 75 or 80 feet tall. And it sits right on the river. And I, one time I went up the river, and I can, I, I, when I crossed the river, I know there's a lot of water. But one time I, you know, I was young and ambitious, and I, was, I walked up and it was running pretty badly. I guess I'm lucky to hear, be here to give that talk, because I walked across an absolutely muddy, ugly river and said I will never do this again. I haven't. Uh, but I had to throw, throw a pair of shoes away. I fortunately had an extra pair with me because I kind of thought they'd get wet, but I didn't think they'd get destroyed. Uh, when I tried to cross the Korea River, I just get over and get a decent picture. Of it. I've been back a couple of times since. Wonderful thing, thing to go do. Go do it on a nice dry thing and go up the Cottonwood Road and come down the river a little ways if you want to find it. It's a beautiful sign. Anyway, uh, I forgot. Oh, the information about Armigo's journey from the Coxcomb to the Hurricane Fall in the journal entries is only four lines long. There are several places that the Colorado Red Pueblo could be located. I'd like to find the one you think it is. Uh, but one of, has many choices for an ancient Indian village in the region east of Kanat, December 13th. I wrote longer than his words. Uh, Ram Creek is almost certainly Kanap Creek, that's December 14. And the water of the old woman, I still got a guy who says, oh, we just saw a picture of an old woman in the, on the cliffs. And I think it's just very typical of what the Indians did. You have 60 men running into your camp when you, if you have a great spring there, a tight spring, and where do you go? You disappear except for somebody who can't disappear, an old lady. They know they won't do anything to her. Uh, anyway, the water of the old woman was likely an old Paiute woman who was left at the spring, springs at Pipe Springs when 60 of Armeo's men arrived on December 15th for their return. The Coyote Plains west of Pipe Springs have not changed much in the past 198 years. It's still a place without water, which they describe, and plenty of coyotes. Although I haven't been out searching for coyotes. I've been in the general area many times, and I see coyotes everywhere, especially in the last couple of years. That's December 16th. At the Hurricane Fall, our mail would write, Limestone Canyon, water from waterfalls. In September 2014, a joint venture of the Armijo chapter in Cage and the Red Pueblo chapter in Canada, the two leaders sitting right here side by side, reported an incredible find at Rock Canyon. The first major canyon south of where the Honeymoon Trail drops into Warner Valley off of the Hurricane Fall. Oh, I did. Oh, I, I got to do one more ad lib because of Jeff uh, Fry. You, you talked about the westward woman, and uh, there was the Kanak finally had a road going over to uh, the, the Coxcomb area, and uh, they were trying to decide where to build a road from civilization to the new Glen, Glen, Glen Canyon now. And 
Kane County just said, they said, well, I'll do it from Garfield County or Kane County. Uh, Kane County uh, said, well, we already have a road that's almost halfway over there. It wasn't a great road, I don't suspect, but it was a road. And um, of course, uh, Governor Clyde, and who's Governor Clyde? Uh, the other county, uh, Kane said, uh, Garfield County doesn't have anything. So why are you even thinking about this? It's got to go from Kane. Well, it eventually did go from Kane. Uh, but the next week or two, Garfield County decided, oh, we got to do something about this. And so all the men got their tractors and trailers and uh, uh, backhoes and whatever, and they built the Cottonwood Road from Garfield County, you know, uh, at the top, all the way down to where Highway 89 goes. They, they just went out and constructed the road. Today, Garfield County wouldn't exist because all of the men would have been put in prison. But <laughs> that's how they did it. Uh, in uh, 1958 uh, or 59. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm kind of glad they did because it's a benefit of it. Right, to, to go on. Now back to it. Okay. I, I've got to get it. Uh, the, the author, me, after after being directed to this site by Jim and Paul, walk down Rock Canyon and see innumerable waterfalls. Ah, here it is. It was a remarkable experience, and I felt immediately this was the place on Neo's group camp on December 17th and 18th of 1869. It was one of my great personal experiences on the historic Old Spanish Trail. Uh, it also convinced me beyond any doubt that Armillo's group rode off the Hurricane Cliffs on the Honeymoon Trail rather than traveling 20 miles north to uh, in the wrong direction again, 20 miles north to the Hurricane area to find a place that had a stinking spring. All right, and that that's the only thing, that's the only thing that he mentioned. It. By the way, this is a waterhole I'm looking at, and that's a waterhole in front of me. But they're everywhere. Now, I hate to say it, when I was there, it was the height of the drought in 2001, and there was no water there. But Paul and Jeff will verify there's nearly always water in that game, <coughs> even to this day. I bet if you are over there now, you find it, especially after next week. Okay, this is what it looks like. Did you see that little mountain peak in the back? Little Creek Mountain Mesa? Oh, I do. We're, we're, we're little green, right above the arrows. So. Oh, the little green, this one. Well, you know where it is. You can see it's the tallest, <laughs> tallest point on there. Okay, uh, I love that place because this is what it looks like from there. You can look down to thousand four hundred feet. The first basically the first fourteen hundred feet is to the Unicaret plateau. Then the next thousand is the Hurricane Cliffs. And where did you say that was? There's a little green oh yeah, there. Okay. Bingo. Guess what that is? That's what limestone canyon or rock canyon what they call it. That's the canyon <coughs> This right here. Get back to the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> that that right there is the uh, honeymoon trail. Go off the trip. It's, it's the only place for approximately thirty-five or forty miles from Hurricane South that you can cross the Hurricane Cliffs. And lo and behold, that canyon's right there with all the water. And the next day, they're talking about a steepy spring. And, uh, anyway, by the way, this canyon, I looked on every map there is, and I couldn't find a name for it. And, and everybody, BLM, no matter what, there, there's no name for that one. And this is Fort Pierce Wash. And this was a muddy day, but they still drink the water, I guarantee you, uh, after uh, getting off of the plateau. Okay. After crossing the Colorado River, Armio's group would be thinking, go west or southwest if you can. The 
party likely had a stinky dead animal at Fort Pierce Springs the next day, that was December 19th, on the 20th, they arrived at the junction of Fort Pierce Wash and the Virgin River and the Santa Clara River and stopped for a two-day rest to feed the mules and animals. Ah, grass. Guess what you don't find in mine something? No grass. This water, yay, no water, but lots of grass. And this is right now in the heart of St. Cage. The whole water holes at Rock Canyon supplied the caravan water, not to feed the mules. At the junction of the two rivers, there was the question of which way to go again. A sharp, a sharp reconnaissance south would rule out going down the Virgin River. It, and we found that out later. It was a foolish way to go down for Jedediah Smith, even two days, two years before, three years before, and later for the Mormon John D. Lee. Going down the Santa Clara River was, uh, well, go there going up the Seneca. It, it's suicide to go down the river. It, it's, it's quicksand. It, I mean, in 18, until 1970, you don't go down the Virgin River. Nobody goes down the Virgin River. It, it's been a no-no forever. Unless you, you know, you really wanted to get out and make a name for yourself or kill yourself. Right? That's the only way you go down the Virgin River. Go up the river, Again, let me read you what I said. Uh, going up the Santa Clara River was a similar situation to what had they faced on the Korea River 10 days before. Why spend an extra day uh, on a trip with, with water one day and tough, go, tougher going the next day when you could all be down in one day? And our mail very likely, I guess you can still, decided to go west. Now, it probably went west from Santa Clara, not exactly same. Through present day Bulldog Pass, they reached what would become the principal route of the Old Spanish Trail. They arrived at the Virgin River again on the 24th of December, 1869. So one day without war, one camp on the hill, Downhill too, except for going through the pass. All downhill, except for <coughs> the route our let's see. Uh, the route our mail took along the Virgin River and on to California is suggested in a paper by Elizabeth Warren in nineteen ninety nine when he spent published in traces. And our meal's life in uh, New Mexico and California is outlined by John Robinson in two thousand five. Again. The route west from the Virgin River would save a day of travel for a male, and the travel would be without water one day either way. Quill's Bulldog Pass is the path that Carpenter, again I go back to 1901, would follow at the beginning of the boundary survey in March 1901. Incidentally, he and his crew completed his 277-mile survey at Four Corners on the 29th of June, 1901. Uh, and I think it was 98 degrees, and then the, the final thing, it was 102 degrees when he actually finished. So they got done just in time. After 98 days of difficult work on the path, a meal followed 72 years. Thank you.